And now I have the privilege of passing this Zoom over to our starting commissioner, Kate Dean. Kate, take it away. Thank you, Arlene. And hello, everyone. Nice to see a lot of your faces. I miss seeing um, all of you in person. Um, I'm not going to be able to see many of you while I do the presentation. So um, I think we will stick with the chat, as Arlene mentioned, if you have questions or comments. That said, I have an uh, important COVID policy meeting right at 1030 here in the county that I need to be in. So I'm going to be relatively brief and then save the hard questions for Commissioner Brotherton, who has to join a little bit late um, and will be uh, taking hard questions at the end. So um, let's jump right in. Just so you know, here, let me start sharing my screen. Um, give you some warning. I'm a little bit of a policy nerd. And so I always take opportunities like this to do a little bit of education on how government works and how it touches your lives. So um, here are is Greg's and my contact information. It'll be on the last slide too. Uh, just wanna be sure you know how to get a hold of us. So I'm gonna point out, hmm, here we go. I wanna point out, this is the last state of the county address I did, which was in 2019. Um, and you know, we have this idyllic view here. This is at the, at the Ducka Bush River estuary um, and all these people sitting close together and you know, like I think back to that time to 2019 and I think like we thought we had problems, like we thought life was was kind of rough and we aspired to this. You know, I think my theme was kind of about building a longer table, right, that more people could be at the table. And um, so when I when I was preparing for this presentation, I found this and I was like, oh, my gosh, I are we ever going to get back to these days? So just wanted to show you that and then show you kind of in contrast, where are we? Uh, 2020 to 2022. So we haven't done this for a couple of years, this presentation. And this is what our life looks like now. A lot of Zoom meetings. Kids lined up with masks, you know, vaccination cards, the protests we saw, major social upheaval um, in uh, 2020. So things have changed a lot. And this was a, a great opportunity to look back on the last couple of years um, and, and, and try and take some lessons. So um, what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what has been occupying the county the last couple of years. Uh, COVID, of course, has a lot to do with that. I'm going to talk a little bit about county government and how it works and the functions that we have and um, maybe dispel some assumptions that you have about how county government works. Um, county government in particular is a little bit of a black hole. People seem to understand what cities do and they seem to understand what the feds and Congress do, but Generally, people don't really understand county government very well. Then I'm gonna go over our budget. We talked about a budget as being the most important policy document because it really clearly outlines our priorities and our values. Um, so show you kind of our, our budget trends over the last couple of years and talk about some specifics of this year. Um, and then I'm gonna look ahead and talk about some priorities. So I know I'm gonna to have to be a little bit brief and I apologize, I'm gonna go over this relatively quickly, but certainly open to, to follow up um, with any of you in another format um, if I'm skimming over too quickly. So just to, to call out the obvious, it has been uh, two years now of COVID really occupying the life of many of us in the county. And that's because counties are really uniquely uh, situated to be dealing with a crisis like this. So we run a public health department, which is doing a lot of the outreach and education. They're doing the contact tracing. That's where our nurses, the public health nurses are housed. Um, they're doing a lot of, uh, providing a lot of testing. Um, we are also responsible for enforcing mandates and sometimes creating mandates. Uh, many of that, uh, those powers fall within either our health officer um, or enforcement from law enforcement. Um, we are required to uphold the governor's mandates. So that, that is in our purview. Um, We've done weekly addresses, really trying to be on the forefront of outreach and education to the public. So first Dr. Locke, the first year, now Dr. Berry, weekly addresses in our Monday meetings, 945, those are broadcast on PBTZ. We run the uh, Department of Emergency Management for the, the whole region, the whole county. They're doing things like isolation and quarantine, vaccination clinics, a lot of communications. Uh, they run what's called the Emergency Operations Center and uh, pro participate in incident command. With the hospital, so they're really overseeing the logistics of how the response is happening countywide. And then the county has 
has been in a position of distributing a lot of funds that the feds have passed down to us through both CARES and ARPA funds. And we'll go into some, um, some further details about how we are using those funds currently and how we're distributing them in the community. And in the midst of this, um, this bizarre crisis, we've also been in a situation of having really strong sales tax um, and increasing property values, which translate a little bit, you'll see just a little bit to an increase in property taxes. Um, and I will dispel some illusions on that too, perhaps for you. So this is what the county has been up to the last couple of years. Um, uh, we are really at the forefront of the COVID response. Um, it, is, it is consuming. We have, I think, done a great job in this community. We have been one of the safest places in the country consistently and really thank the community for being willing to be um, good partners in, in containing a virus, keeping our community pretty healthy. And, um, but of course the economic impacts have to be acknowledged. And I know that's been hard and hard on many of you. So a little bit of background on counties. By statute, really largely in our state constitution, counties are required to do very few things. These are what is required elections, courts, law enforcement, these aren't small things, these are big things. But um, it's, it's interesting, there's often an assumption, for example, people will say, well, aren't counties responsible for providing housing? Aren't counties responsible for providing utilities? We're not. This is, this is all that is stated in our, our constitution and the statute about what we are required to do. In reality, we do a whole lot more. And I apologize, I know sometimes on a, um, Zoom screen, it can be hard to, to read. So I apologize, but get the idea that we do about a million other things. Um, and so there's a, um, uh, it's an interesting difference in expectation of what, we're, what we are required to do, what people think we should do, and then what we actually do. And that's part of what makes it a little bit tricky to understand uh, how counties function. Um, and of course, we don't do any of this alone. We do it in partnership with lots of other governments and other community groups too. But just, you know, for example, we, we um, are required to regulate and uphold many state and federal laws. Um, sometimes we, we don't even agree with them, but we have to do it anyway. We get lots of money in grant funding. You'll see that your taxes um, uh, do not account for all of the operating funds of the county. We get literally millions of dollars from the feds and the state every year, in part to uphold the, those programs um, and uh, implementation and regulation of their policies. We are on many shared boards, city, county, port, PUD, hospital, school district, you name it, we are in partnership. And, and I'm gonna show you some examples of how our funding breaks down among all these different governments too. Um, we're very involved in policy during the state legislative session. So that is something I spend a ton of time on right now. Um, a number of bills come up that affect counties and we weigh in, we help write bills. We work very closely with our legislative delegation um, to advance the issues that we care about. We have a new intergovernmental collaborative group. Again, that's city, county, port, and PUD. Um, those four governments are trying to work together better. We came together during COVID to have a more coordinated response um, and to write a recovery plan. Um, and that's been really successful. Those governments have not always played well together in the sandbox. So it's, we, we are much more effective when we're working together. We don't always agree, um, but better to be at least attempting to, to identify the direction we wanna be pulling in together. And we actually won an award from the uh, City and County Managers Association for the, the innovative work we did in trying to, to work together. Um, government to government relations with tribes, very important. Uh, sovereign nations all around us in the form of uh, our tribal governments. And we care deeply about respecting their uh, treaty rights. Um, and then uh, I, I actually tend to travel to Washington DC fairly often too. We have uh, the need to, to kind of stay in front of our members of Congress and make sure they understand what we need and what rural counties need, communities like ours. So none of this work is done in a vacuum. Um, okay, when I move into budget, and there'll be lots more nerdy government stuff here in this section too. Um, just want to give you an example of uh, the way that our budget is growing right now um, for a number of um, unique reasons. So you'll see 
2019, revenue is about $51 million. 2022, so three years later, up to 68. In 2023, almost $80 million. Um, a big chunk of that is the CARES Fund and ARPA Fund um, that we received last year and we'll be distributing over the next couple of years. And then a big chunk of that is the appropriation we, we received from the state legislature for the Port Hadlock sewer. So um, these bumps are not necessarily um, going to be sustained over time, um, but certainly the goal is that we are growing a tax base, not for the sake of taxpayers giving government more money, but um, in the hopes that that means that people have more, um, more living wage jobs, um, that there is investment happening. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about, about how, how those funds flow. So our, um, there's a kind of artificial division between what we call a general fund and what we call other funds. Um, and the, the, uh, I won't try to try to capture the breakdown too much. It's fairly, it's fairly obvious though, when I get into the details here. So um, there are two primary sources of tax funds that counties get, and this funds a lot of our operations. Property tax is expected to be around eight and a half million dollars this year. And sales tax is expected to be about $5.1 million. And I'm going to go into more detail about what that means, but I do want to call out because there is the assumption and sometimes correct assumption that property taxes are going up very fast, quickly, very high right now. And I, I do wanna remind you that, and that you've probably heard me say this before, if you've heard this presentation, we have something called the 1% cap that um, the uh, legislature approved a number of years ago, which says counties are only able to increase the total amount that they receive from property taxes 1% a year. New construction, the value of new construction is added on top of that. So it ends up being often more like two or 3%, although existing property owners um, uh, are limited to that 1% cap. So, what, what that means, given that we assess properties every, uh, well, there's an assessment done every year, um, but only one out of five kind of regions of the county do they do a deeper dive to really understand what the increases in value are. What that means is that where of these five districts, if one of them is seeing a bigger increase in values, and although we're seeing a big increase in values across the county, Port Townsend is seeing it most sometimes more of that 1% increase will be concentrated in, in one area. So for example, in Port Townsend. So even though the whole levy is going up only 1%, um, a little more of that is going, might be felt in the district where you're seeing the most increase in value. It's complicated. I would love to do a whole deep dive on taxes um, sometime because it, it's actually quite fascinating. And I'm, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail here. I see Commissioner Brotherton has joined us. Hi, Greg. Um, I hope you'll feel free to jump in if I'm missing any important points here or you want to add anything, okay? Uh, maybe we should, I think they, they booked a special meeting, so maybe you should call us to order. Oh, thank you, you're right, sorry. Well, no, we did it as a joint meeting and uh, uh, Arlene called us to order. So I, th I think we're okay, um, but yes, this is a, a public meeting, a special meeting of the Board of Commissioners since two of us are here talking about county business. So we have some formalities we have to abide by. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanna talk about here. So you'll see the other taxes in relation to property tax and sales tax are much lower. The vast majority of our general fund revenue, and that's kind of our unencumbered funds, the funds that the county can do with what they please are property tax and sales tax. So I'm gonna go into more detail. And again, I'm sorry, this is blurry. Um, on the left, we have a breakdown of where our sales tax goes. And on the right, we have a, a breakdown, this is from my property, my home, of where our uh, property tax goes. So we think you pay one tax, it just goes into this pool, if somebody spends it and we get services. But it's actually interesting to see if you break down even our sales tax, um, you know, we have here. So this is if you're in the city of Port Townsend, you'd be paying 
uh, some to the city, the general fund for the county, that's kind of our, our baseline tax. Um, but we have a, a, a public safety special purpose tax. We have transit, we have criminal justice tax. We pay for 911 through sales tax, uh, a mental health tax, affordable housing and supportive housing tax. Some of these are required by the state. Some of them we have taken on. Some, some of these voters have approved. Some uh, your electeds have approved. Uh, hotel motel. So um, sales tax is not, is not one static thing. Again, example of how we work with all these other governments. The county collects for all of these purposes and then distributes them. So those are sales tax. If you look at property tax on the right there, and I do want to call out specifically the state levy for schools, the big chunk, the biggest chunk by far. That went up a lot when the state did the McCleary decision, or fixed the McCleary decision. Um, they increased their levy a great deal. And while they limit us to only increasing our tax by 1% total per year, they don't put that on themselves. They increased all of our tax, our property taxes, quite a lot um, to, to fix a, a, a legitimate problem. Problem. Um, but you'll see that's that's a really big chunk of it. But then we we have conservation funds that come out of property tax. We have levies. That's developmental disabilities, veterans, mental health, um, city taxes, our port tax, PUDs, hospitals, schools. We have a local portion of our schools separate from the state portion. Fire district, emergency services, uh, conservation district, protecting water quality and um, land use in rural areas and noxious weed assessment. So I uh, just wanted you to know, and this, all of this information is available to you on your, on your tax statement for property tax, on our treasurer's website, the sales tax information, but your tax dollars go to a lot of places to serve a lot of really important functions. Um, okay, so we do have other, um, other revenues that come in, and these are largely um, through grants and taxes. The two highest I'm going to call out here is public health, about $5 million. That's largely state and federal grants, some of which are just granted purely. They're not competitive grants. It's a, a grant that is given for operations. And then county roads, we get a portion of gas tax. So some of the tax, the high tax you pay on uh, gas in Washington state comes back to the counties to maintain roads. I should point out, cities don't get a portion of gas tax. So sometimes people complain about how bad the roads are in the city and they actually say, well, the county roads are pretty nice in comparison. And this is why. Um, solid waste, $3 million, $3.7 million. That's tipping fees. That's what you pay when you um, go to the dump and drop off your garbage. Um, community development, that would be um, permits what people are paying to, to purchase, uh, to pay for a building permit and other services in the building department. So this gives you an idea of some of the other sources of revenue we have. Here are expenditures. So again, general fund are kind of the things that don't have specific uh, uh, requirements put on those dollars. And this, this slide is often shocking to people. You'll see this, the sheriff accounts for 7.1 million. These are, uh, this is our budgeted for 2022 which is pretty darn high, but if you added in the courts, the prosecuting attorney, um, some of the other services here, public safety ends up being, you know, sometimes 60 plus percent of a local government's budget. It is, it is huge. Um, and when you try and do that really well, um, which I, I think we, we value in this community, um, it gets even more expensive. We do a lot of diversionary um, courts or therapeutic courts. Um, and you know, I think in the, in the long run, those are quite cost-effective to keep people out of the uh, criminal justice system, but we spend a lot of money supporting folks so that they are not repeat offenders. Um, so this is, uh, you know, again, it's surprising to see not, not a lot relative, all the other departments are relatively affordable and the, the sheriff is a, a huge portion of our general fund budget. So sorry, this is a million other little funds, but again, I'm just gonna call out the big ones. So other expenditures, public health, about $5.3 million. Most of that was funded by the 5 million we saw in grants coming in. Uh, community development, again, they have a revenue to offset this. This is how we, we pay for staff to issue those permits, solid waste, uh, we spend that money that we receive in tipping fees goes right back into that department. 
I know I'm moving through this kind of quickly. I, um, I did want to call out just the uh, what a strange economy we are living in right now. We anticipated COVID would create um, uh, a, a very different outlook and just point out the bar graphs here. Um, so these are preliminary estimates of taxes through the end of 2021. And you'll see, I mean, so one is the general and optional sales tax on the left and the one on the right is hotel motel uh, lodging tax, higher than ever, uh, kind of bizarre. We're trying to understand what, what, what this is about. The economy is kind of stumping everyone right now. And we're seeing it locally too. Arlene, is anything popping up in the chat that I should be aware of? Anything you want me to touch on before I move too far off of exciting things like taxes and budgets? So I think you have dazzled them um, with numbers because they've stopped typing. So for those of you who have questions before we lose Kate, please put them into the chat. And if not, Commissioner Brotherton is going to get a host of questions. So go for okay, it, I'll Kate. Just have, I'll just have a few more minutes here and then I'll leave all the hard questions to Greg. Um, so, you know, we, we are seeing this bizarre rise in, um, in revenues and in economic activity in the county, and yet we have a lot of problems. We are still largely a poor rural county, and we must not forget that. Um, I'm just going to have to run through these last slides real quickly. So it brings me back to this, you know, where we were in 2019 and thinking about how do we, how do we build a longer table? How do we bring more people into prosperity? Um, when we have these, these strange conditions of a strong economy and a lot of poverty actually on the ground. I'm just gonna run through real quickly a few priorities of mine. Greg is gonna go into greater detail about some of the nuts and bolts of what we're actually doing and how we're trying to solve some issues. But um, uh, the, the Tri-Area Sewer Project, we're now actually calling it the Port Hadlock Sewer. I need to update the title because we, we have rescoped it. We got actually about $24 million from the legislature in the last uh, few sessions. Um, and construction will be starting on that in 2023 and go through 2026. They'll need a little more funding for it, but this project that has been in the works for 20 years to, um, in order to be able to gain density in our only urban growth area outside of Port Townsend is finally happening. So, uh, really appreciate public works, great work on making um, Again, not gonna have time for this, Affordable housing and regulatory reform, you'll hear about from Greg, Olympic Discovery Trail, big priority. We really want to have regional trails connecting folks. We want there to be non-motorized options. We want people to have healthy, free, accessible recreation. Um, planning for climate change. This is something that is never funded by the state, and somehow we always have to eke out a little bit of, of staff capacity, but um, the North Olympic Development Council has been a great partner in getting some grants to help with planning. Um, our community development department is looking at um, some floodplains in South County, how to make those more resilient. We have a new sustainable forestry program on hundreds of acres that the county owns. We're trying to manage for um, forest health as well as carbon and some um, uh, revenue for the county. So big priority. Uh, the jump playground is going to end up being a, almost a $2 million project when it's done. Um, we use some of our ARPA funds for match. Uh, this is a playground for the uh, that is accessible to all kids with different needs. Um, and one of the first real big capital improvements we have made to a county park in a long time. So excited that that's going to be happening in the next couple of years. Uh, our ARPA funds and CARES funds are going to a number of capital projects, uh, small business loans to the EDC you'll be hearing about helping out with some uh, match for a PUD broadband grant, also for Jefferson Healthcare Child Care Grant, a hydraulic lift for the Port of Port Townsend, helping to stabilize Fort Worden PDA, repair to our Brennan and Port Townsend Community Center, and increasing wages of county employees, which um, while folks appreciate a good stable job in the county, those have been nearly poverty level wages. Our, our wages have been very far behind other jurisdictions and not keeping up with the cost of living at all. So we've been able to bump up salaries for the people who make all this stuff happen for all of us. So I um, encourage you to engage with us. Uh, we meet all day Mondays. You're welcome to join us there. Um, and I'm going to leave our contact information on the next slide. And I just want to put in a plug. There are so many um, committees, advisory boards, that we rely on. These are volunteer positions we have a hard time filling. 
Um, but there's some really great opportunities to take part in government, to see how the process works, to be a part of shaping a vision for the future of our community. And I really encourage you to do that. So I'm sorry, I have to run. Here is our contact information. Um, I'm gonna ungracefully hand it over to Greg and race into my 1030 meeting. <laughs> Thank you I, so I guess, much, Kate. Sure, and I guess that means I actually have to stop sharing, but we're not hard to find. You can Google us pretty easily. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry to run. Thank you, Kate. Okay. We appreciate it. Yeah. Great job. You, yeah. Well, I don't have any PowerPoint presentation. So first, I guess I would, are there any questions based on, on Kate's uh, uh, presentation? Please put them in the chat if um, you okay. have any. Type fast. And um, Greg, you can see the chat because you're not sharing your screen. So when, if they pop yeah. up. Um, we'll let you know. We do have Facebook questions, but we're going to hold those for the end. Okay. Let me just bring the chat up so I do see them if they come up. And I'll, I'll kind of expand on some of the, the topics that, that Kate, she did a great job breaking through um, the many, many things that we do. You know, and as the county commissioners, we also represent the county and our, our residents on a bunch of other boards. I was late because I was at the Salish Behavioral Health Administrative Service Organization meeting with Kitsap and Clallam County. And that's just one, one uh, of the many kind of multi-jurisdictional uh, partnerships that we have. And we have a tribal representative on that as well, Teresa Lehman. And you know that distributes a lot of money from the healthcare administrator, uh, uh, healthcare authority to our uh, behavioral health providers. So we have a new recovery navigator that's kind of a pre-law enforcement diversion uh, program that was funded by the HCA and that is already nesting well with our sheriff and city navigators that are, are looking for kind of a, a diversion approach to some of the behavioral health issues that, that affect so many of our, our, our residents and our, our real impacts on, and drains on our the, kind of the social fabric in our, our network. So do a lot of different things. Uh, in this strange time of, of uh, COVID, we've had a lot of, you know, support dollars, the ARPA dollars and the CARES dollars. And, and also we're getting more funds from revenue sharing uh, from you know all of the federal forests that are not logged anymore in Jefferson County. And we have recently uh, taken the fairly bold step of actually um, planning for those dollars as we budget, as go, go through our, our, our biennial budget uh, process. So we can make sure that we get the dollars that are coming through into service for the community. And that's really what we're here doing, whether it's you know the assessor and uh, or the auditor and elections or public works and roads and, and parks and, and, and the ODT. There's a uh, hundred ways that the, uh, the county touches um, our lives. I guess I wanna focus a little bit on housing, which we know is a real crisis in, in Jefferson County. Um, I just got off the meeting, both uh, Clallam County is interested and Kitsap County has just passed the house, the one-tenth of 1% 1 sales tax for affordable housing, which we councilmatically passed at the end of 2020, and which raises about $650,000 uh, this last year for affordable housing. And it's been a real, a real boon. It was basically the gap that allowed us to... Um, to break ground on the Seventh Haven project, affordable housing project that was referenced in one of Kate's slides. And I'll talk just a little bit about that. Um, OLICAP, and I'm sure people are familiar with OLICAP, but maybe not with community action programs, which were part of uh, Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty. And, and really years ago, Jefferson County uh, kind of designated OLICAP as almost our de facto human services organization. We have a lot of uh, important partners in that in that arena, but most of our our block grant funds that might pass through to some of our other providers like Bayside or Dove House end up coming through OLICAP. And uh, um, again, one of the roles that we play is, is where we have a city council member from from Port Angeles and from Squim and from um, and from Port Townsend, as well as a county commissioner from from uh, Clallam County and myself. So the Seventh Haven project is, uh, there was one small area, I believe it's 43 units of affordable housing and 28 seats of childcare that is already broken ground. They've just about got the, uh, the parking garage uh, poured in concrete up at Castle Hill next to the community development uh, um, uh, department on, by QFC there. And that project is uh, 
really important, you know, and it's it's only one one of the one of the uh, rungs of the housing continuum that is broken because I think we all know that affordable housing is uh, broken at every level right now. We have tax refugees, we have COVID refugees, we have climate refugees coming from out of county, and it is more and more difficult for our workers to be able to live in Jefferson County. So this is one of those steps um, that I think that goes up to 80%, 60% uh, AMI, area mean income, median income. But we are working on efforts with um, the 5090 funds and the recording funds, which we can support our, our housing providers um, to create uh, subsidized housing. Um, uh, but it's, re it's really challenging. We're working on the regulatory level to address some of the institutional problems that create a not great situation for creating housing developments. And, you know, the, the urban level sewer in, in Port Hadlock is one of those uh, critical junctures, right? We want to make sure that we create equitable development in, in Port Hadlock with the with the policies that we we set up, but we don't we don't make decisions as the BOCC. Is this land project going to go through, or is it not going to go through? It's a delicate balance of setting up the policies to uh, end up in 20 years with the results that we want. You know, more affordable workforce housing in Port Hadlock being a goal. So we're revising our plans to make sure we don't end up with a development pattern where you know. Sag Harbor has been mentioned to me before, where you develop some urban level infrastructure and then uh, the rich get richer and the poor get poor. And that, that cycle is, is really hard to stop with policy, but something that we're taking very seriously and engaging with the community as we uh, develop that project. Um, on the homeless housing is a, is a big part of the, the housing crisis as well. And I think that we've made good progress in a pretty intractable problem that we had out at the Jefferson County Fairgrounds where we had an encampment that was, you know, no one had authority over it. And it was kind of a perfect storm of uh, the, you know, the governor's moratorium on evictions uh, because of, of COVID, as well as House Bill 1310, which is still being interpreted and kind of corrected in the legislature and which uh, basically was a hands-off policy for, for law enforcement in dealing with folks that are going through, especially behavioral health issues, but um, very difficult to interpret. And then you also had, uh, well, there's several, <laughs> there were a lot of factors, but it was a really dense neighborhood and it caused a lot of problems, um, impacts both for the surrounding neighbors, for the utility of the fairgrounds, which is a, you know, a community asset that we want used for the whole community and also for the residents themselves. No one likes being in a fishbowl. So, uh, we did use some of the ARPA dollars to purchase a property that we are developing into an outdoor um, uh, emergency shelter. And we have kind of a, a bare bones architecture infrastructure in there right now and are getting uh, bids right now and, and forming a budget to uh, install some bathrooms, laundry facilities, a little bit more infrastructure to uh, really preserve dignity and to um, increase access and the county has gone through a lot of uh, ordinance writing and in as to kind of create guardrails around these facilities so we can um, not stand in their way but also make sure that the impacts to the neighbors and to the environment are, are mitigated um, and really to get the the best results you know I mean our point in time count which is the annual uh, count of homelessness uh, usually comes up with about 200 folks. And that's always an undercount just because of the distribution of homelessness through a rural county is very different than it looks. A lot of people that um, would qualify under HMIS or other, other state systems as homeless don't see themselves as homeless. They're just marginally housed. And that's where regulatory reform comes in too. I mean, my personal goal is to lower, lower the barrier of what we consider a house. <laughs> you know, if we, can, if we can start permitting people where they're living, and that gives them a lot of uh, support to um, to build their own wealth, to build their own uh, lives. So uh, I firmly believe in the housing first model, and it's uh, demonstrated real successes so far. And we have we're looking at the community land trust model as well as a board, and in talks with Habitat and other providers 
to, to support taking land out of the speculative real estate market and still allowing folks to build equity in, in houses and housing, but the, the crazy uh, value shifts they're going right now with the speculative market is, is making it unaccessible to a large portion of our, of our population. And we're looking for ways that we can, we can address that and, and, and help equity. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about our ARPA dollars and the uh, small business grants. We recognize that small businesses have been, well, some have been impacted incredibly. You know, I, I had a grocery store that closed during, during COVID and, and the grocery store down in uh, Quilcene that I opened that my brother runs uh, has never been better. You know, so the, the, the distribution of impacts of COVID are not equal. And that's uh, an unfortunate reality. But with this new, we've dedicated $500,000 of, uh, of the first tranche of ARPA money, the rescue plan money for small business loans. And we're working pretty, pretty uh, hand in glove with uh, Team Jefferson EDC and their new director, Cindy Brooks, who I'm sure has been here, um, to work out criteria to try to find those that need it and, and get them the money with the minimum of paperwork as possible. One of the problems with some of the, the, the funds to date have been just the, uh, the, the rigor of applying for them for a small cottage industry. You know, if you're asking for a, you know, profit and loss record, some of these businesses maybe have never had one before. So creating a, a low barrier for entry to these grants that are, I believe are from one to $20,000 is, has been really important and trying to find ways to demonstrate need and making sure that uh, those that didn't qualify before qualify now. So um, the criteria are just about done. Team Jefferson EDC will, will put that out pretty soon and we're hoping to get these dollars in people's pockets uh, as quickly as possible. Um, a little bit more on Team Jefferson EDC. There's a renewed uh, interest and support in, in that organization's um, ability to uh, foster economic development in Jefferson County. So the, uh, the four jurisdictions, the port, the PUD, the city of PT and Jefferson County have renewed our funding and are uh, adding to the, the board composition and the new ILA. We have a member from each uh, elected body on the, on the board and we wanna make sure that it has the resources to really support businesses in Jefferson County and, for, and, and sustainable economic development. Um, and uh, I guess I want to just tout a little bit more the partnership that we've really been developing with uh, our partner agencies. When I came on the board and historically just as a resident, there always seemed to be a lot of tension between our jurisdictions, between the city and the county is operating at cross purposes. And I think that we, we understand now that we are all in this together and we are trying to work together and we don't agree on everything, but uh, continuing to work through the problems and coming back to the table has proved really fruitful so far. When we formed the Intergovernmental Collaborative Group at the beginning of COVID, it was to distribute the, the CARES dollars, the first tranche of support dollars that we had in Jefferson County from the feds. And we wanted to get as many folks as possible uh, to give input in how that money should be distributed. So with the ICG and then following that, community groups in a, a variety of sectors that were all kind of uh, collaboratively developed was a, a start of partnership that we are really building on as we continue to work, whether it's the city's Evans Vista project, you know, we are talking to them and want to be partners instead of competitors in this, in this uh, work that we all share. Um, talk a little bit about one of our other partners is the, the PUD. And I just wanted to give them props uh, for really stepping into the broadband arena. Um, you know, broadband is one of the issues that I campaigned on years ago in 2018 when I was trying to get this gig. And it's not really in the purview of the BOCC. So we are not the decision makers on that, but we all recognize the, the need for, uh, I mean, COVID has highlighted that more than anything else, the need for uh, broadband throughout our rural community. And we've uh, we formed the broadband action team with the PUD and, and citizens that were working on this issue. And we re meet every month or every week, every Friday 
Um, I also, they're still meeting. <laughs> One of my four meetings that I have going on simultaneously right now. Um, but I'm just really proud that the PUD has just gotten a, a $9.7 million grant to provide uh, fiber to the door and will be the first PUD in, in the state of Washington offering retail broadband service to the kind of the middle, middle point out to Cape George, as well as uh, the rest of Maritime Island that don't have uh, broadband, which is um, at the state level seen as uh, 25 down and three megabyte per second up. So anything less than that, um, and for the very reasonable rate, rate of $65 per month with, um, I think there's also income uh, bonuses that can get you down maybe $30 more. So really exciting too that they, they got that money. They're applying for grants down in the South End and the Coil and, and uh, they got another one for the Anderson Lake Road. And while Jefferson County isn't the prime actor there, you know, we also dedicated $750,000 of our ARPA dollars to match that grant application to the broadband office that they just got for that $9.7 million. So demonstrating local support with these dollars for projects that are maybe we don't get the credit for, but that substantially benefit the community is what we're all about. And our, our public works department is great at leveraging grants and they usually you know, for every dollar of general fund money that goes into our roads, we're getting $10 of, of grant funds for fish barrier removal for, um, you know, bridges, the bridge down over the little Quilcene River and Quilcene's getting replaced to the tune of five and a half million dollars today. And now more than ever, um, there are opportunities for that, that kind of leverage. And we we're looking for those to the benefit of the community. And that's really our focus, I think, um, going into 21 is building partnerships and leveraging the, the relief dollars that we have uh, to, to, benefit, to benefit Jefferson County. So I think I'll stop there and see if uh, anyone, no, no chat, chat questions, but is there anything that I haven't addressed that you'd like to hear about or questions um, on any topic with Kim? So Commissioner, um, we have uh, uh, some questions coming in from Facebook. And I'm going to rephrase them a little bit. Um, okay. And and one of them, I, and I think that would be really good because I know how committed you are to regulatory reform. And it might be really good to explain a, a little bit of how that's working because the question is the length of time and complication to permit in Jefferson County. Yep. And that's, that's a, a narrative that has been around for a while. And it's true. It, it does take a while. Um, and we're working on that. And as everyone's uh, hip to the, the issues with staffing, but we do have an uh, almost entirely new department in DCB right now. So they, there are capacity issues. And of course, when the county commissioners uh, put regulatory reform requirements on their shoulders, that, that is additional work that that department has to do. So we are looking to streamline it in a couple of ways. We've just made the, uh, the CAMs, the customer assistance meetings, which were traditionally uh, covered by general fund dollars. And then we, because of capacity issues, we went to charge for them. Um, that money would come out of your application ultimately. So I really regretted that decision and we've recently made CAMs free again. Um, so there are, there's a lot of movement happening there. Um, we will have InterGov, a new, a new uh, permitting system. They are been go, it's been delayed with COVID, but I believe by June, we'll have a new permitting system online. And they have uh, my, I keep stomping my feet about this, but permitted the online uh, capacity as well. So while it won't initially be set up, um, hopefully by the end of 22, you should be able to uh, submit a permit online, perhaps get over the counter permits for you know, smaller projects. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to reduce the, the burdens. We're also, I've worked a lot about getting, bringing more community involvement to uh, processes like the update of the critical areas ordinance and the shoreline master program. And I have to say, I'm not, I'm not sure if that was the best use of community resources. Uh, you know, I, I think going forward, we have to 
I don't know, we're all guilty of confirmation bias at some, at some bit. And I, I really, I wanna support our planning commission as we move forward in their, in their efforts to, to be that citizen body. So finding areas that we can be leaner is an ongoing process. InterGov is gonna be huge in that. The county is also, we've dedicated another $200,000 to the Department of Community Development out of the general fund so they can staff up and we've taken some temporary positions and, and made them uh, uh, permanent positions to try to retain people. Retention has been a problem for Jefferson County for a long time. And it's, you know, we, we just haven't paid as much as, as uh, competitors have. Other counties, the port, the PUD, the city, you know, we, uh, so we're, we're recognizing that. And as Commissioner Dean said, we did, uh, our collective bargaining has really increased the compensation to try to keep our good employees. And often our longevity bonus has been uh, triggered at 10 years. And we've added a five year trigger because we find that we really struggle to keep folks for those first five years and, uh, and setting up ways, I guess, facilitating internal growth is something that I don't think we've done great as a county that we're consciously working on right now to, to continue to train our folks so they can step into the next step, next level of responsibility within the county and to promote a career path that is sustainable and builds a resilient workforce is um, one way that we're addressing that. But it, you know, it is slow and, you know, we have been trying to get stock ADU plans into, uh, into the as a possibility and it just, you know, there's, you can't, can't get blood out of a turnip and that's what we're trying to do a little bit. So we were just, I'm learning patience in this myself, but uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to speed this up and you can always reach out to a county commissioner at one of our, we're liaisons with the folks as well. And that that's a two way communication. Sometimes that means explaining why this delay is happening. And sometimes that means, uh, you know, stomping my feet and, and saying this delay isn't acceptable to uh, to the department. And while I don't, uh, we stay out of operational control, we are here as a relief valve for when those issues uh, do go on too, far, too long. So I guess I'd encourage folks to, to reach out to us. Kate shared our email address. It's all our first initial last name at co.jefferson.wa.us. And I think that you will find that we are all responsive and we all want to help, but we also represent the county and there's limited resources that are a reality we can't change in the short term. So Commissioner, we do now have some questions in the chat and two of them are um, regarding transportation and, and transportation is a huge issue here, so. Yep. Um, well, we serve with a city council member uh, on the Jefferson Transit Authority. And that's one area where we can make a difference. Uh, since I've been there, I've been trumpeting the, that we should have free fares. And the lens has changed with COVID and the, the equity protests that we had last year. And now we are free fares on Jefferson Transit. Utility, utilization is still far below pre-COVID numbers. But um, uh, Commissioner Dean and I are also working to recast our strategic plan of the Jefferson Transit with a real emphasis on climate change adaptation and mitigation. That means getting more people on services. Uh, and I'm eager, we have to uh, approach board composition every four years and that's coming up, a conversation I look forward to. And I'm, I'm trying to get uh, a rural school board member onto the board because I think some of those rural transportation issues are more understood by our school districts than they are by anyone else. They are uh, some of the bigger, bigger transporters in the region. And as we, again, look to uh, record investments in infrastructure and climate change and mitigation adaptation, we are buying our first electric bus for Jefferson Transit. The, the city trolley that, will, that goes around Fort Townsend will be electric here soon. And we're also building infrastructure for four charging bays for electric battery electric vehicles um, going forward. Technology is still changing. I've been a proponent of electric vehicles for, for ages, but uh, it's, going, it's kind of a, a generation behind in, in the public transportation. So we are working towards electrification and alternative fuels and uh, adding services. You know, we have a new Kingston, uh, uh, Kingston pedestrian ferry connector that's going to start in February. 
and that'll be a great service from Haines Street or Four Corners or the Gateway uh, Visitor Center straight to that uh, fast ferry. And the fast ferry will be free, I believe, for the first month that that service is open because Kitsap County, uh, Kitsap Transit, which runs it, um, allows new new services to be offered free for, for a month. So um, I think that's transportation. I mean, the county's committed our own climate action plan is, uh, involves electrification of the fleet. And uh, we've got our first electric vehicle and, and looking for more and looking for charging station infrastructure um, opportunities as they come up as well. So we, we have a question on the um, Caswell Brown Village. Sure, I can, uh, I'll, I'll jump into that a little bit. Uh, so I'll just uh, kind of talk about the spending, even though we didn't have any at the fairgrounds first, we didn't have any oversight over the population when they were at the encampment uh, at the fairgrounds, but we did still uh, supplement. We paid uh, Bayside to provide a meal a day, provide uh, OLICAP to provide monitoring services, though they had no authority to actually make anything happen, um, and paid Dove House for supplementary services, tents and things that folks needed. Um, and we paid the fairgrounds for the impacts on their grounds, for, I think it was a, 130,000 all told gravel and um, there were some pretty severe impacts to the to the the fairgrounds. Um, when we to move them, we paid uh, $500,000, $600,000, excuse me, for the property. We paid uh, about 100. We, we approved up to a million dollars initially from our 3.125 million ARPA first tranche. Um, that got us phase one. So we got them out of there in out of the fairgrounds at the end of September. Um, they are still living in very primitive situations. They are also very appreciative that they are there. It's not, you know, it's not a perfect situation, but they do feel like they're out of the fishbowl. They're having community me meetings and are have oversight from uh, OLICAP, and they are officially an outdoor shelter now. So if there are health and safety concerns, it is easy to ask uh, folks to leave, which is that unfortunately had to happen a couple of times. Um, it costs about, I think, $8,000 a month in salaries to, to run this. And that's something that's often not considered when thinking about homeless housing is that this is supportive services and they're the O&M, the ongoing make costs are significant. Um, OLICAP is looking for alternatives to pay for some of the operations, but uh, so far we've continued to pay that. We are just getting bids for the expansion of the phase two area, which will include a septic system um, and uh, electric electrical to, I think, uh, an outlet for every two units. And that, unit, that will be uh, 40 units of uh, tents, wooden tents, RVs. There's kind of, it's kind of separated into two sections. We'll be in a different area. We always are looking for community um, assets that we can add. We're in talks with the Quilson School right now of uh, an old portable that they are would have to pay to demolish that we might try to move up as a, a, a temporary congregate shelter for a couple of years. Um, so we're also in talk with the community build project that we're responsible for building the um, um, Pat's Place and, and Peter's Place uh, villages to continue to build wooden tents for, for this population down here. I will say these, this is um, according to like state strictures, this is up to two years people can stay at, at one of these uh, shelters. It's uh, transitional housing. So it's not permanent housing for folks. And that's, there's a lot in the faith community that I've spoken with and the community build project that are looking to build permanent villages. And that's the kind of partnership that I'm trying to to develop because I think there's a real opportunity for a faith-based master plan resort that that creates a, a permanent living space for for um, some that are marginally housed or unhoused right now uh, but I think that it will probably cost a million five to get uh, infrastructure up to the point that it's um, sustainable you know showers bathrooms laundry kitchen facilities um, electrical I mean they have electrical now so that'll come from ARPA and, uh, and I'll have the, the full budget in a couple of weeks and I'd be happy to come back and share and go into more detail if that would be something that you guys would be interested in. We have um, a Brennan question in the chat. 
Let's pull down here. And the mouse. Uh, yeah, Brennan area. So uh, Commissioner Dean alluded to one project that we're doing down there, the Brennan Community Center that's operated by Holy Cap is uh, there's a hotel on the second floor that is can't be used for a hotel. It's uh, really unsafe. It's been, been issues with squatters uh, periodically and it's not in good shape that it's uh, collapsing. So this year we've put $125,000 into engineering and design for a new roof. And uh, then we are, we've dedicated, I think a million and a quarter to putting a new roof on the Brennan Community Center. I had a couple conversations with some folks that were in the latest uh, storm event, which you know was an emergency storm, um, trying to come up with a, a warming center option, uh, an emergency gathering place down in Brennan, which has been, you know, at various times, the community center or the school or the fire station. And so I'm convening some some of those players to to find a sustainable, like an emergency. I think the fire department's already planning on building a backup, installing a backup generator. But uh, I'm convening a conversation to figure out what does that look like? How, you, how do you distribute that information to the, to the folks that are impacted? I mean, you know, we have folks that are aging in place down there. I talked to a, an 88-year-old woman who didn't have power for a week and, and couldn't even get out of her own driveway. So you have real accessibility issues down there. Um, on the broadband level, uh, they are served by Mason PUD in Brennan. And so there was a grant with Hood Canal Communications um, the, an NTIA grant, the Jefferson PUD applied for one as well, but this was a private company with the support of Mason PUD one that gives provides power down there. Um, and so I don't think those NTIA grants awards have been announced yet, but I you know, wrote a letter of support and, and trying to get uh, it's a it's a broadband and a food desert in Brennan, unfortunately. So they are they are. Um, uh, urgent issues, criminal activity. I've, I've heard about this a lot. I mean, we have, you know, logistical problems with the distance between areas that make it really challenging for the sheriff's department to provide urban level service in rural areas. And, you know, I, it, it's a problem. I don't I don't know the solution to that. I, I think it's, it's something I know the sheriff's department is, is responsive, but, you know, if it takes I mean, it takes 45 minutes to drive down there. It takes 45 minutes to drive down there. They've had, we've had talks about offices um, more remotely. And there was a sheriff a de a deputy embedded at the Quilcene School for some time. And I think those are, those are opportunities that still exist. We, we do it on the West End, which is of course even more remote than, than uh, Brennan, where we have a, a dep two deputies that, that live out on the West End. And that's, it's a difficult and expensive uh, support services, but uh, it's not impossible. Thank you, Greg. I think that is the last of um, the questions in the chat, and the timing is perfect. So um, I want to thank you and um, Commissioner Dean for joining us today. We are so grateful for all that you do on behalf of our community. And these days, government is just a teeny bit more challenging than it was when you committed to serve. So we are very appreciative of what you do, and keep on doing it. You guys are doing a fabulous job. and. Um, it's really a privilege to be serving on planning commission now with the, um, all of the new exciting things that, and the commitment to the county. It, it is really fabulous and I would hope that more of the people who are on this call will get more engaged not only with planning but with all of the commissions for the county because you really can make a difference. Absolutely. And Thank I'm, you. Yeah, I want to thank all of you for taking your time today to be on this call and to participate and your questions were fabulous and so we appreciate your participation and hope it'll be ongoing. We have some, we hope, engaging cafes coming up and we are here to work for all of our business community and here to help you. The county um, mask distribution program, the KN95s, is continuing through the chamber. We got the second tranche of masks yesterday. so. Um, please give Upuli a call and set up um, your fair share of masks to help with your business. Please stay safe and stay healthy and help our community and your neighbors through these really challenging times. The most important thing we can do right now for all of us is to shop local. 
Thank you all. Have a great week and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. And I'll come back to talk about sea level rise. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs>